Hello, and welcome to the Through the Eyes of She Conference, Equity in Health, Education, Business, and Leadership for the African Woman in the 21st Century. My name is Dr. Christine Garuya, and I'm on faculty in the Department of Emergency Medicine at the Yale School of Medicine at Yale University. I am also the committee chair for the conference and delighted to be here with you all today. I will start with a story. Around three years ago, on a trip to East Africa, I happened to encounter my former high school teacher in Kenya. We both happened to have separate affairs in the country at the same time, and he had come to find out I would be in the area. So he reached out to me and I obliged to meet with him. You know, you girls are lucky that you had a father like yours, he said casually, one of the first comments out of his mouth. I was a little perplexed, reflecting on the fact that I have two parents who raised us, a father and a mother, and wondered where he could be going with his comment. You see, if he hadn't let you girls go to school, he went on, you would never have been able to accomplish what you have today. If he hadn't valued your education, you wouldn't be here. I paused, nodded my head in partial agreement, and we went back to catching up. It was not until a while afterwards that his comments really struck me. My former teacher was onto something because less than half of African countries have achieved gender parity in education. And the African girl child still lags in primary and secondary education when compared to her male counterpart. This is driven in part by a historic favoring of boys when investing in education among children in the home. My teacher was correct. If I had a different father, there might be no university degree, no medical school, no public health research in Africa, no mentees and trainees across the continent that I've had the delightful opportunity to work with, maybe no conference. But this is not about me because there are many such women and young girls across the continent who are vulnerable to such disparities in access to. Some of them are represented on this meeting today. One of you listening might be her. And I find respectfully that Often we don't think that these things could affect us, our colleagues, our friends, our mentors, but they could and they do. The Through the Eyes of She Conference, I hope, will be an opportunity to do just that, to pause and think on the status quo for women in the African business sector who suffer from underrepresentation at every level of the corporate ladder and a fall in the number of, of women represented as they climb in senior management, according to a recent McKinsey report. This despite the fact that companies with at least a quarter share of women on their boards have an average 20% higher earnings than the industry average, data that has been demonstrated in multiple other settings. We will look at the status quo of gender equity in health, for which we know issues such as maternal health and the imminent rise of non-communicable diseases still loom and the underrepresentation of women in science, which further hampers progress. Finally, we will look at the status quo of gender equity in leadership and in education, as I mentioned previously. So whatever your background, I hope that you will be able to approach the next two days with an open mind and willingness to engage with the outstanding speakers and content that we have lined up for you. I know I will. Today, on day one, we will primarily feature talks on business and leadership, and tomorrow, primarily on day two, those on health and education. These panels and talks were selected by the conference committee from a pool of submissions and reflect countless hours and thoughtful input from many of you from both within the Yale community and beyond. You will also hear briefly about programs, departments, and schools affiliated with Yale whose missions reflect those of the conference and that ideally can act as a resource or provide opportunities for future engagement beyond this meeting. To that end, we will have a number of opportunities for networking, as you will have noted on your schedule in trying to make this virtual experience as interactive as possible. 
You will receive direction on how to navigate between sessions on the platform, reminders on sending in questions, and prompts along the way to help us fill out evaluations on the meeting for future potential iterations. In closing, I would like to give a few thanks because as always, it takes a village. Thank you very much to our conference committee with special mention of Nora Langat and Janet Rohina, without whom this would not have been possible. I'd also like to thank our other conference committee members, Eddie Mandri, Elijah Painsel, Michael Capello, Moraga Kibicho, and Jonathan Wurtson. Thank you to the Yale Conference and Events team, Megan Paluzzi, Tara McHugh, and colleagues, and to Jesse Kimodo for your hard work on our beautiful conference materials. I would like to give tremendous thanks, of course, to our sponsors, <clears throat> the Edward J. and Dorothy Clark Kemp Memorial Fund, the Hakeem and Maima Bella Asagie, <clears throat> excuse me, Provost Fund for the Promotion of Africa, the Yale Office of International Affairs, Yale Council on African Studies, Department of Pediatrics Global Health Program, Yale Institute for Global Health, and the Yale Women's Faculty Forum. Thank you. And of course, thank you to you, our speakers and audience for your motivation and drive to contribute over the next two days, all 500 of you from 36 different countries, 178 different cities across the world. We did not cap our registration once, but twice because of anything special that we did, but because I believe there's a real hunger for change on this topic. And on that note, getting right to our program, I'm going to be introducing our first speaker, someone who is a giant on Yale's campus and an internationally recognized leader in business. Professor Amy Resneski is the Michael H. Jordan Professor of Management at the Yale School of Management. She earned her BA from the University of Pennsylvania, where she graduated magna cum laude with an honors degree in psychology. She received her PhD and MA degrees in organizational psychology from the University of Michigan. She has won the IBM Faculty Award for her research, as well as awards for her undergraduate, graduate, and executive teaching. Her research on the meaning of work has been published in a wide range of top academic journals and highlighted in several best-selling books and popular press outlets, including Time, Business Week, Harvard Business Review, US News and World Report, The New York Times, and The Economist, as well as best-selling books such as Give and Take by Adam Grant, Drive by Daniel Pink, The Happiness Advantage by Sean Acor, and The Art of Happiness by the Dalai Lama and Howard Cutler. Amy has engaged in research projects with several organizations, including IBM, Google, the United States Military Academy at West Point, the University of Michigan Hospital System, Nest Technologies, and Burt's Bees. Her current research involves studying how employees change the designs of their jobs to shape the meaning of their work, as well as the implications of seeing work as a job, career, or calling for individuals and organizations. Professor Rezneski, welcome. Thank you so much, Christine, for that, uh, that kind introduction and warm welcome. I am delighted to be here with all of you today and to have been invited to tell you a little bit about myself, about the Yale School of Management, and of course, our distinguished keynote speaker this morning, Dr. Amina uh, Garib Fakim. So uh, to dive right in, um, I am, as Christine said, an organizational psychologist interested in what it is that makes work meaningful. Um, and how organizations, managers, leaders, and workers alike can act upon the work context to ensure the well being of the people who, uh, who work there. I'm particularly interested in the struggles to find meaning in work in challenging contexts. So, for example, when there is an absence of work um, and individuals are moving between employment opportunities, uh, people who work in stigmatized jobs, uh, people who work in occupations that are disappearing, um, usually through technological changes, um, and people who work in physically isolated settings. Um, I have come to be convinced of the crucial role played by governments, by organizations, and by individuals in co-creating the conditions that support the experience of work as meaningful and the experience of the self as someone who matters and is valued. 
Um, I am very proud to be on the faculty of the Yale School of Management, which was founded in 1978 as the Yale School of Organization and Management. Um, the mission of the school is educating leaders for business and society. We have long had a focus on students who come from or go to the nonprofit, governmental, and private sector to work and lead in organizations and to manage across a wide variety of contexts globally. Um, for generations, our students have been sector switchers or sector straddlers who have sought to create cooperation, collaboration, and understanding across sectors to solve the world's most difficult problems. More locally, our state governor in Connecticut, Ned Lamont, and our city's mayor in New Haven, Justin Elliker, are both graduates of Yale's School of Management. Um, our school offers several degrees. We have a full-time two-year Master's of Business Administration program that enrolls about 350 students a year. And we also have an MBA for executives program with three specializations in asset management, sustainability, and healthcare. This brings in about 75 students a year. We also offer a Master's of Advanced Management program that uh, draws students from all over the world and is a one-year degree program, um, as well as a Master of Management Studies in Systemic Risk, which brings central bankers from around the world um, to Yale for a year of studying macro credential policy and financial crisis management. We also have a global business and society program for early career students for whom the degree follows a year of a master's program at a partner school in their home country. This year, we're excited to introduce a new degree program for early career students who are interested in studying asset management. More specifically to the theme of today's conference and tomorrow's conference, we have in our non-degree programs, a women's leadership program that draws students from around the world, from all sectors, who either already lead or hope to lead in their particular organizational spaces. The keystone though, I would say, of our global strategy is our global network for advanced management. Many business schools have partnerships or exchanges, but our global network um, has connections with students and faculty at 31 other schools and engages in meaningful exchange across those programs in a variety of ways. We've partnered with 11 schools in Europe and the Middle East, 10 schools in Asia and the Pacific Islands, four in Africa, so Strathmore um, in Kenya, the University of Ghana, Lagos Business School in Nigeria and the University of Cape Town um, in South Africa um, and six in the Americas as well. Each member school is a leader in its respective country and the schools reside in both well-established and emerging economies. The global network for advanced management goes beyond the typical exchange program um, that have become a popular way for business schools to make a global connection. Rather than create a one-to-one -one relationship with one school abroad, um, the global network creates opportunities to span a range of economies, countries, and cultures. In fact, our own students will work in teams in just a few months with students from all over the network on a collaborative project. The Global Network is a platform for both formal, formal curricular innovation and in individual initiative. Um, more specifically, perhaps, to thinking about the tie to society, though, the School of Management's Global Social Entrepreneurship courses link teams of Yale graduate students with mission-driven entrepreneurs in various countries. The global social entrepreneurship teams partner with local organizations to address a variety of management challenges. The course has worked with organizations in Kenya, Ghana, and South Africa, and in 2022, we'll be again partnering uh, with Nairobi-based social enterprises. In 2020, the Global Social Entrepreneurship Program worked with six Kenyan social enterprises, which focus on issues relevant to enhancing women's social and economic opportunity. Partners have included a company that manufactures fuel briquettes for schools that reduce indoor air pollution, a nonprofit developing vocational training programs, a firm expanding free access to the internet, and a company that links small, uh, smallholder farmers to affordable rental of agricultural equipment. We also have here at Yale, the Yale Research Initiative on Innovation and Scale, what we call YRISE, which advances research on the effects of policy interventions when delivered at scale. 
several research projects have focused on Africa, including rainwater harvesting, understanding how gender and relationship disparities affect communication among farmers, and gender differences in the impact of vocational training on Malawi's youth. Malawi's youth. Um, the school generally, I will say, is deeply focused on global equity and gender equity in both business and leadership and works to break frames and assumptions to inspire our students to imagine what they can do to help create the kind of world they most want to see. Um, and so with that, I just want to say how delighted I am at this point to have the opportunity and the honor to introduce our keynote speaker this morning. Uh, the former Mauritian President Dr. Amina Garib Fakim. I'd like to tell you uh, just a little bit about her incredibly impressive uh, accomplishments um, and, uh, and history. Uh, so she has been the managing director of the Center International de Development Pharmaceutique uh, Research and Innovation, as well as the professor of organic chemistry with an endowed chair at the University of Mauritius. Since 2001, she has served successively as Dean of the Faculty of Science and Pro Vice Chancellor. She has also worked um, at the Mauritius Research Council as Manager for Research. Dr. Garib Fakim earned a Bachelor's in Chemistry from the University of Surrey and a PhD from the University of Exeter in the UK. During her academic journey, she has participated in several consultation meetings on environmental issues organized by international organizations. Between 2011 and 2013, she was elected and served as chairperson of the International Council for Scientific Union Regional Office for Africa and served as an independent director on the board of Barclays Bank of Mauritius between 2012 and 2015. As a founding member of the Pan-African Association of African Medicinal Plants, she co-authored the first ever uh, African herbal pharmacopoeia she has authored and co-edited 30 books, several book, book chapters and scientific articles in the field of biodiversity conservation and sustainable development. She has lectured extensively across the world. She is a member of the editorial boards of major journals and has served on technical and national committees in various capacities. Elevated to the order of the commander of the star and key, by the government of Mauritius in 2008, she has been admitted to the Order of the Chevalier dans l'Ordre de Palme Académique by the government of France in 2010. She was, has been elected fellow of several academies and societies um, and has received several international prizes, including the 2007 L'Oreal UNESCO Prize for Women in Science, the African Union Commission Award for Women in Science in 2009. On June 5th, 2015, she was sworn in as the sixth president and first female president of the Republic of Mauritius and served in that capacity until March, 2018. She was elevated to the order of GCSK by the government of Mauritius and received the Légion d'honneur from the government of France in 2016. In 2017, she received both the Lifelong Achievement Award of the United States Pharmacopoeia CEPAT Award and the American Botanical Council Norman Farnsworth Excellence in Botanical Research Award. In 2018, she received the Order of St. George at the Sempero Pernball in Dresden, Germany. In 2019, she received the Trailblazing Award for Political Leadership by the World Women Leaders Council in Iceland. In 2020, she was elected honorary president of the International and Engineering Institute and received their 2020 fifth IETI annual scientific award. She has also received the IAS Comstec Ibrahim Memorial Award from the WIAS in Jordan. In 2021, she received the Benazir Bhutto Lifetime Achievement Award and the Obata Prize. In 2021, she was appointed as Distinguished Professor at the John Wesley School of Leadership at Carolina University in the United States. I am uh, delighted to welcome um, our honored keynote speaker today, Dr. Garib Fakim. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Reznevsky, uh, Professor Christine Yangura, Professor Michael skoni Skonigniew, I'm sorry to have, uh, uh, I'm not very good at Polish names, 
members of the organizing team, uh, dear students, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, and good day. I would like to thank Professor Christine and her team for associating me with this event. I'm equally honored to be speaking today at one of the finest institutions of learning, one of the most haloed portal of academic excellence, and I'm grateful for the opportunity. The legacy and record of academic excellence that Yale University has achieved is exemplary and one to be admired and wherever possible emulated around the world. And what from uh, uh, Professor Amy has, uh, has already explained, I'm very pleased that, that you have a presence, of course, uh, in Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, as a former first female head of state in my country, I am first and foremost a scientist, and I have always used my pulpit to champion not just the cause of science for development, but also to speak on the empowerment of women. So I will start my speech today with a story that I recently read and I would like to share with you. <clears throat> a young boy is involved in a traffic accident and is immediately rushed to the hospital for urgent surgery. In the bustle and chaos of the hospital environment, the surgeon strides into the operating room. Think of the quintessential surgeon, the A-type, brimming with confidence and authority, one who knows instinctively how to take charge. Yet, this distinguished surgeon looks down at the boy and gasps, I can't operate on this boy, he's my son. Indeed, the boy is the surgeon's son, yet the surgeon is not the boy's father. How do we explain this riddle? I know that everyone in this room can see the answer immediately. It is simple, the surgeon is the boy's mother. Yet, I also know that plenty of educated and erudite people, no less including plenty of educated and erudite women, do not see this at first blush. They puzzle over it, circle around it. They suggest uncle, grandfather, stepfather, answers that really make little sense. Unfortunately, despite all our gains, this is the persistent reality. Similar scenarios have also happened to me in the course of my career. For example, when I was a university pro vice chancellor and found myself alone in the office, responding to a ringing phone, the typical question I received on the other side of the line was, is this the secretary of Professor Garib Fakim? Ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to thinking about women in powerful position, we are often blinded by and stubbornly products of long embedded bias that tends to mire our thoughts. The higher up the status pecking order, up to and including the position of head of state, the more this, this tends to hold true. We are all aware of this and fight against it on a daily basis, Mauritius and all over the world. We are also aware that this attitude pulls us back and slows the evolution of our country, our region and the global economy. But these prejudices date back to the existence of mankind. This sort of entrenchment takes active, sustained, and dedicated effort to drive away. It cannot be done in a single generation, but it must be done. We need a complete mindset shift for this 21st century, for the full and equitable economic participation of women in order to fully unleash all of the earning power of our national economies and eventually the global economy. It is not sufficient to make progress against ingrained gender inequality. We must eradicate it altogether. We must say collectively, let us dare to be the generation to make the definitive difference. Let us act together as a community of women and rise to conquer our own timidity learn to take risk, defeat our own prejudices, and even subconscious antagonism towards other women to face up to the fact that the elimination of gender inequity is in reach. And as Madeleine Albright once said, national quote, there is a special place in hell for those women who do not help other women. The inverse of this is women have a special power to be advocates for themselves, and each other. We must become aware 
of that power and unleash it. Ladies, unfortunately, ultimately, it will be for us women to open the doors so that others may live and prosper. We need to direct that kindred spirit to help out the younger generation. Take our literal and figurative daughters by the hand and teach them to benefit through our experiences. Mind you, this is easier said than done because women tend to disparage other women more than do men. That's the tragedy and the paradox. Being honest with ourselves and with each other about the subtle undercurrents that can result in competition, winning out over mutual support is the first essential step towards rooting out our weaknesses and freeing our better selves as individuals and now the sisterhood of women. So the question now is how do we proceed? How do we build a critical mass of empowered, prosperous, confident women who can drive our own destiny? Ladies and gentlemen, let us start with the basics, education. As Nelson Mandela said, education is the most powerful weapon that can be used to change the world. Mandela's belief has special leverage as applied to women. Another great world leader, Mahatma Gandhi, once said, educating a girl is educating a family, a community, a nation, and eventually the world. Educating women creates an amazing ripple effect as an educated woman is likely to spend her resources on her family and on the education uh, and health of her children. If the moral imperative to educate girls is not sufficient, the economic return should be. The IMF recently reported that a study of around 60 developing countries revealed that the economic loss from not educating girls at the same level as boys amounted to nearly 100 billion US dollars per year. Now let us pause and think of the economic cost of not sending our kids to school over the past two years in many parts of the world. Thus, educating a girl must not be perceived as a threat, but rather as both a blessing and as a practice that makes good economic sense. Just like Christine, I am a product of that vision. My parents believed deeply in education for their children, no less for me than for my brother. Indeed, they were right. Education has elevated me giving me that springboard of substance and self-confidence to aim higher. Good education empowers, breaks down barriers, promotes critical thinking, and frees the individual from exclusion, and in my case, insularity. Without a good education, we start life with a severe disadvantage, one that few are able to compensate for. This will become increasingly true into the future, given the technological world in which we live. For those without education, the future is beyond bleak. Conversely, for those with a good education, avenues of opportunity open up. Countries that have invested in education have shown that it leads to not just empowerment and access to opportunities, but also to a reduction in gender inequality. This is a focus I would like to bring back within the, my role at the level of many boards in Africa and this is also my own way of giving back. For all our progress, ladies and gentlemen, persistent gaps exist. And as mentioned before, this trend, this tends to be increasingly true as we move up the ladder of seniority and therefore influence. For example, while girls and young women are the majority of those who enter the biological, health and medical sciences in many countries, they fall out of the pipeline in numbers much greater than do men as they move up the ladder of seniority. We must do and can do better. In 2015, for the first time in the history of the United Nations, science was recognized as having a central role to play in helping humanity achieve the SDGs. Success in the SDGs will lead to a better world for all of us. This is where the investment in girls' education is critical especially in developing countries. It is precisely in these regions that the contribution of women and girls can make the biggest differences in stimulating the economy. In the 20th century, the United States showed the way by its trailblazing education policy that institutionalized the integration of races in education settings, favored science in the thick of the Cold War, 
ensured equal education opportunities between the genders through the passage of Title IX. While these milestones may seem modest today, at the time they were controversial and courageous. Today, the US is still reaping the benefits of these decisions, which have helped drive the country's economic leadership with gender equality a crucial component of that strategy. Small investments can result in large gains for girls. One extra year of primary school can boost earning potential by 10 to 20%. At the secondary level, an extra year can result in an impressive 25% boost of in, in, in earning potential. Ladies and gentlemen, Mauritius, I'm proud to say, showed the way in the early 1980s. Education was made free in 1976 as my country achieved big gains in our budding manufacturing sector. The same uneducated women who were cutting sugar cane could now manipulate machines and eventually program the software that run those machines. An educated woman contributes to the labor force and when a woman thrives, the country thrives. Female represent over 50% of the world's population and yet, the contribution of women is less than half of many measured economic activities. Still today, nearly 1 billion women are excluded from the full participation in the economy. Africa suffers from this reality. This gender gap of almost 50% is a large contributor to lesser economic productivity in Africa than in fully developed countries. When women do progress beyond the lowest tiers of the labor market, they tend to remain at middle management positions, earning low pay in often low status jobs. Not surprisingly, the informal sector has a high representation of women. And moreover, in this sector, employees tend to be unskilled, realize unstable earnings and are left unprotected. And of course, women dominate in unpaid jobs, caring for children and the elderly, and where they're not just uncompensated, but also unrecognized, unappreciated, and unprotected. Here I think of my own late mother. Had she not dedicated her blood, sweat, and tears, her every ounce of energy to our family, I would not be standing here today talking to you. I salute her and all women like her who toil every day to keep families whole and together. Thus, another clear message. The more women contribute, the better the economy fares. Eliminating gender gaps in economic participation implies big jumps in income per capita, a vital measure for the economic well being of any country. These countries in the Middle East and in North Africa that have experimented by investing in the economic advancement of women have reported between 23 to 27% increase in GDP. And of course, it goes to follow that productivity begets productivity. The contribution of women in the paid workforce increases expendable income, which in turn increases spending capacity and in turn drives a healthy economy. So if we produce, if we improve the purchasing capacity of women, the economy will do better. So ladies, let's be agent of change. Let's go shopping. Ladies and gentlemen, change will happen where we make it a priority. Another area ripe for attention is the law. In many countries, women are still being subjected to all inheritance laws and loans and bank accounts require a male co-signer, father and husband. Changes in law can become powerful agents of change. Think of progressive countries like Sweden. Sweden pro-family, pro-women policies have resulted in massive progress. Policies like publicly funded parental leave, quality, affordable government subsidized childcare, free or subsidized early childhood education, individual instead of family income taxation, and tax credits or benefits for low wage workers. Sweden has the highest female participation rate in the world, in part because of these policies that support family and children, and also place a premium on flexible work and parental leave policies. Is it only about policies? No, it is also about changing our mindset towards women generally. We need to sweep aside that macho attitude that has kept women behind for so long. And one area where this happening is the field of the STEM. The ubiquity of technology and the centrality of science to sustainable development have influences far beyond the STEM find themselves to create greater participation of females 
in many areas, such as agriculture, for example. Ladies and gentlemen, with education and labor comes another important element that will ensure full female economic empowerment, leadership. Female leaders have been few, but those who have made it to the highest level of leadership have had a lasting legacy. I think of Catherine the Great, Elizabeth I, Wangari Matai, and Marie Curie, my own role model. They are women who decline the well-beaten track and follow their own courageous and visionary trail. But the sad fact remains that the higher you go up the ladder, the fewer women you meet. In my country, there's less than 15% representation in the National Assembly. Fewer than 10% of Nobel Prize winners are women. One irony and tragedy of this is that women leaders have qualities that can result in better leadership because they tend to make decisions based on consensus, inclusion, caring, empathy, compassion, and the focus on long-term sustainability. Their leadership has been crucial during the COVID era, and this has highlighted these very important features. Yet, in unacceptable numbers, they are denied access. We must show that by being caring, we are not being weak, and that conversely, toughness is not necessarily strength. We must help build confidence in our girls and younger women. It is denied to the girl child when she's told systematically from a tender age that she cannot become an engineer or that physics and mathematics are too complicated for her. Her lack of confidence is also reinforcing her job. She tends to apply for a promotion when she feels she's 200% prepared, in contrast to a man who at a much lesser level of preparation will often leap forward. Only by helping change this mindset will we reset the narrative. Now I will say something that I thought I would never say. In many sectors, especially in the political world, we may only achieve the goal of equality through quotas. The slopes are too high for us to climb without some help towards the top. Quotas, unfortunately, may be a prop that we need in the initial stages. Role models, and the availability of mentorship of successful women can be critical success factors that need to be plugged into the equation to achieve true parity. For example, mandates on the proportion of women in parliament and the corporate boards may be necessary for the immediate and even foreseeable future. Our hope, one hope, I hope that quotas are a temporary necessity, but they may be a necessity for now. So in conclusion, my message is simple. We need to change the mindset in our 21st century. We need to do away with this ingrained mentality that works against women empowerment. We need to keep daring to make the difference. And we need to keep investing in the ingredients that will provide for the empowerment of empowerment. Let us start looking out for each other. Let us create a world where that little girl out there in any village in Africa can grow up prepared and able to fulfill her potential. Let us ensure that nobody ever again will doubt that an African woman can become that top engineer, doctor, or that minister, and that she can lead because she has the education, the intelligence, the charisma, the drive, and maybe more importantly, the confidence, compassion, and caring attitude that this fragmented world needs right now and beyond. To succeed, we must dare. If we dare, we will succeed because success goes to those who dare and rarely goes to the timid. I thank you for your attention. First of all, good day, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike Skinechny. I am the deputy director for the Yale Institute for Global Health. And first wanna say uh, what an honor uh, it is for me uh, to be part uh, of today's event. Uh, congratulations to uh, Christine and the conference organizers for, for putting together a fantastic agenda. And also just to say what a true honor it is uh, to be here uh, with um, Dr. Garub uh, Fakim. Uh, thank you so much um, for joining us today um, and for uh, your keynote address. Um, so, for the next, uh, I guess, 20 minutes or so, uh, I'll be facilitating a, uh, a question and answer uh, session. So I would just turn your attention, I believe it's to the right side of your screen where there's a 
Q&A function where you could submit questions and those will be then uh, sent on to me. So I hope you take a moment uh, to do that. Uh, but maybe to start, to start off, um, uh, Dr. Gurub Fakim, what would you, from your perspective, what do you think are some of, what is the kind of the greatest threat or the greatest threats to achieving gender equity? I mean, you've talked about some of these elements, but what do you see as really the top issues that, that, that make it such a challenge? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mike. There are many issues. It all depends where you're coming from. Um, even in the developed countries, the salary, the salary gap, the pay gap is an issue. Uh, if you look in some parts, it's ingrained in the culture. And so there are many moving parts when it comes to looking at uh, uh, kind of mainstreaming women issues and uh, getting women to, the, to that top position there. But I think in my country, if that was used as, as, a, as a lab, uh, we have shown that uh, feminization of sectors have happened when we started giving education to all the girls. So education, 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 and that is the way to build substance and in, in that girl, to build her self-confidence because if she's fully educated, she will know her rights, she will also know her responsibilities, and she will be able to fight for it. Because I use the word fight very carefully because she will have to, to engage in a fight to make herself heard, to make herself known, and it is still not a given. So we have to keep on developing the mass. We have to keep on increasing the volume of the volume and the numbers of women going through the pipe because we are still looking at the leaky pipe syndrome. So by the time the, they, they come out of the other side of the pipe, there will be still many, many, many left. And uh, so we have to increase numbers going through. So educate the girls as many as much as possible. That's great. We have a. Uh, a question from the audience, uh, um, and actually I'd like to, to, to build on this as, as well. You know, you, you spent a bit of your comments around leadership. And so the question is, what do you think are the opportunities to achieve parity uh, in political leadership uh, in Africa? Um, you know, in Africa, uh, contrary to what many people may believe, I mean, there are many countries that are already leading in gender parity. I can cite a few countries. If you look at a country like uh, Rwanda, for example, a country like Ethiopia, uh, a country like South Africa, they have had the, this uh, trend of uh, getting parity at the political sphere. But I think in many parts of the world, it's the women themselves who actually, uh, they are discouraged uh, because of societal pressure. And uh, women, the society will encourage her to get up to that level of middle, uh, middle management. And then for her to push up beyond this, to get to that leadership position, there are, first of all, pressure from society because uh, just to give an idea, a woman is not very comfortable sometimes going to a happy hour. And this is where the networking happens among men. And this is where, uh, you know, she has to, her confidence has to be built, for example, to actually go for promotion. So these are some of the issues that hold the woman back. But as I mentioned in, in, my, in my talk is that if we have a quota system, and this is how, for example, countries like uh, Scandinavian countries, um, they have imposed quota in many, uh, in many areas, even on the membership of boards. So if uh, these companies, they actually overstay, they don't actually abide by the quota in these organizations, uh, the, the government can shut them down. So we have to have the law on our side. We need to change the mindset as well, uh, because uh, at the end of the day, uh, parenting is both my father and the mother. And again, these countries, they have moved ahead with the laws. They have made it very friendly. And uh, so they, they have made massive progress. And the, the laws in, in these countries, they are very, very family oriented. And uh, so we have seen the progress that these countries have made. So there has to be a suite of issues that come together to push that woman all the way up to leadership position and position of power, because I make the difference. Why we need women at the position of power is because at the level of power, she can influence policies. And uh, this is again where the damage is done because there's not many women at this level of position of power. So when the policies are being shaped, it is shaped through the lens, through the male lens. And we miss out quite a bit because if we had brought in the female ingenuity, if I 
brought in the female perspective, these laws would have worked better for the family, for society, and for the country at large. So this is one of the reasons why we need to encourage and push these women at the position of power. Leader position, there are many, but position of power, this is where we need more women. Thank you for that. I, on this theme of leadership, I, I wonder if you could just reflect on your own experiences as a former president and other leadership roles. What kind of lessons learned might you share uh, uh, for our audience um, You know, when you were in those roles? Uh, uh, what did you do? What made you successful in those roles? Um, I've had uh, a great cheerleader. My father was my cheerleader, so begin with. And he was telling me all the time, there is nothing that I can't do. I could do anything. So I grew up with this confidence because my father had said to me that I can do anything so I can attempt anything. So when I was growing up, uh, risk-taking was second nature to me. And I am a product of that risk-taking attitude or mentality that was ingrained in me at a very early age. I'll just give you an example. When I was at, at school, I'd finished my, uh, uh, you know, what do you call it in the, in the, the high school. And um, I went to visit the career guidance officer and I said, uh, I would like to study science. I want to do chemistry because I'm passionate about chemistry. The first thing he said to me that science is for boys. You should not be studying that because you are a woman. And also when you come back to Mauritius, there'll be no job for you. So that was the first uh, advice I got as far as studying science is concerned. I went back, I discussed with my father. He said to me, what are you going to do? I say, I'm going to do just that. I'm going to follow my heart. So that was the first thing. The second thing, I went into an area, chemistry, because I was still looking for the chemistry any, in, any, in, any, um, uh, science, in any field I was, I was operating in. And when I came back to Mauritius, after my PhD, I was still looking for that chemistry. So this is when I landed in the field of uh, medicinal plant phytochemistry. And just like Obelix, you know, I fell into the pot and I never came out of it. And so I started a, an area which was totally new. I created the lab, I created the space for that particular research because I was convinced as we are living in a biodiversity hotspot that the chance of adding to the body of literature and knowledge was there. So I went ahead and did this. Then I left the university because I was convinced that my field of research was open to, to business creation. And I said that this is the future for Africa. More and more graduates need to become entrepreneurs. I left my comfort zone of academia and I started my own business. I became an entrepreneur. I took a big risk because not many people have done this. Not many people still haven't done it in my country, although this is like a nature now in many parts of the world. And the other, uh, the other time I took the risk is when I threw my hat in the political arena. I said, if I can serve my country at the highest level, why not? Even though I was there with a David against Goliath match because in the opposition, there were very big parties. I threw my hat in and David won. And the other risk I took, I got married. <laughs> well, thank and you. I'm still that. married. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you for those uh, very inspirational comments around you know, support and 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 risk taking uh, throughout your career. Um, let me turn back to our audience question. So I, I think this we're, we're kind of maybe returning to your comments around policy. But as a former head of state, can you share experience about specific economic and educational programs specifically for women and girls empowerment in your country? Uh, uh, or from other countries that you have lived in? Uh, sorry, the, the policy for education generally? For, for women and girls empowerment, education, maybe even other areas as well. Um, we know when I was in, uh, in, at the university in the world of academia, what I was seeing is that uh, the girls, they're doing so much better. Education was free for all. In fact, when Joe Stiglitz visited us a few years ago, he came back and wrote an article in the New York Times, an op-ed. And he said that he had been to a country where education was free, health was free, uh, social safety net was free, was given by the government. And the, 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 he came up with a with comment that, uh, you think I'm going to a very rich country or to go to a country which is on the verge of bankruptcy? And it was none of that. So that was my country that he visited. So making education free for all and also addressing the issue of science at a very early age and uh, learning by doing, 
learning by smelling, by touching, by tasting. I mean, these are very, very important components. And I think we are seeing that, that now in the, what we are increasingly referring to the fourth industrial revolution, how we need to have a different approach to education. In fact, in some places we have to unlearn, relearn and reskill and upskill all that. So that's inbuilt. And we also paid some plenty of attention uh, to the vocational sector, to the non-vocational sector. And of course, with the dose of science actually put in into, into, into the whole system. So this has been, I think, a game changer, as I said, but more importantly, in the initial, uh, in the initial days, giving basic education to the women generally has been a game changer as far as the economy was concerned, because we could actually leverage in the 52%, uh, otherwise they would have been left uh, on the wayside because the policy, at least the tradition, the culture in our part of the world is it makes economic sense to be educating a boy because the boy, well, ideally would look after the family, whereas the girl would be married off and be sent away. But now with the, with the change uh, in attitude when education became free, that was a real big game changer as far as we're concerned. And now we're increasingly investing in the space of science, technology, and uh, uh, because we want to focus on the knowledge economy and the knowledge economy means, of course, a heavy dose of investment in that space. Yeah. Maybe your, your, your note uh, around culture, um, another great question from our audience. Um, uh, can you comment on kind of how we balance and retaining African culture um, while still ensuring progressive and necessary attitudes towards women and gender equity overall? You know, um, if you go back to, well, history, if you go to Egypt, for example, we saw that uh, when uh, the excavation uh, were happening, you know, discovery of the, uh, the, the, the pyramid, there was a discovery made in terms of what we refer to now as the Ebeus Papyrus. Ebeus Papyrus documented plenty of recipes and they're still providing solutions to our healthcare challenges. Now, Africa is replete with these traditional knowledge. And the custodian, they are the elderly, the custodian are women. And this area, which I have spent my life kind of trying to put uh, the scientific framework around this, can give important medicine, which are culturally and economically acceptable and accepted. So culturally accepted because people have uh, grown up with it. They know it. They recognize their grandmothers have used it. So that can become a big pillar in terms of addressing the health challenges. The other side, uh, the other uh, area that I think uh, where Africa can make a huge, uh, can make huge gains is um, the tradition uh, of, for example, the textile sector. Uh, the print, in fact, I was very happy to see Christine, beautiful uh, blouse that she brought in, African print. And there's such a diversity, there's such knowledge. And if you look at the dye sector, and, uh, you know, there's amazing richness in the, the, the tradition, in the culture, and of course, in the inheritance that a lot of these women have, have got. And uh, so by privileging by supporting these women who are custodian of all this information, we can turn it round on its head actually and make it a pillar of Africa's development and Africa can export this to diaspora, which is hungry for recipes, which is hungry for tradition, which is hungry for textile, for fabric coming out of the continent. And so I see a lot of potential in re-looking, casting a fresh eye into the culture and traditions of the continent. Yeah, that's great. I mean, it, 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 turning back to you know, the discussion around policy, uh, education, other, uh, other areas, how can we reach um, girls and women, particularly in rural areas that might not have access? You know, you were, earlier were talking about STEM to technology, these kinds of, uh, these kinds of opportunities. Uh, how can we support women and girls in, in rural areas? You know, uh, I have always said this and I would sound like a broken record by saying this again. When we are teaching our kids, uh, well, I, I went through this because I was living, um, I was a child during the colonial days. And when we are teaching the alphabet to a child, very often we'll say A is for apple. And I think that if we are going to make education relevant to these girls out there in the village, 
we have to make, we have to adapt, we have to tropicalize the syllabus and make it fit for purpose. So there's a huge, huge approach, pedagogical approach that has to be brought in so that the child, especially the girl child, because very often she'll be actually, uh, you know, pushed aside uh, often enough. So when we're looking at the education of the girl child in Africa or anywhere for that matter, we need to look at two main figures. We need to look at the structure. We need to look at the stereotype. And stereotype, we know that the books are replete with stereotype. Uh, we hardly see any women who actually made it, who are you know, uh, trailblazers who don't actually, uh, they, they're not represented in the books. We also need to look at the structure. So we need to look at the syllabus. So all these, if we put the ingredients right, and I think one prime example that Kenya has is precisely Wangari Matai. I mean, she was a child growing up in rural Kenya and she was a very bright girl. And just like myself, I mean, she had a father and a grandfather who believed in her, got her to school and uh, she got spotted for a scholarship. I think she came to the United States and got her, her graduate degree and went back. And I think she's a fantastic role model that needs to be you know, recognized and celebrated. Now, the question is, we need to ask Christine, how celebrated is she in the country? <laughs> That's great. Um, you know, one of the things, you know, uh, I was really struck when you were describing your kind of lessons learned in leadership. I mean, you, I don't know how many times you mentioned risk taking uh, and and what if you could speak a little bit more of a question here uh, around how you build your confidence um, at the it seems an element was your your father your family your mother um, but what what were the other elements that built your confidence through your career so you could you were really able to to achieve those uh, leadership roles. I give myself um, the, the target that, you know, if you are publishing, for example, uh, in scientific publication, you get evaluated by virtue of the quality of your work. So I said to myself, I have to target excellence because excellence knows no gender. And when you start adopting this philosophy, you will, you will not compromise on the quality of your work. In fact, the quality of your thinking, the quality of your surrounding, the quality of your friends. So quality, quality, quality in whatever you're trying to do and push for this because that's the only thing that will matter at the end of the day. And when you start addressing the, the issue of quality in whatever you're trying to do in your perspective, I mean, that will boost up your self-confidence because then you can speak to your peers, you can speak to your equals, you can speak to anybody. And when you actually go to a conference, you present the result, people will see what you're trying to do and uh, do just that. And in fact, as I said, I created that area of uh, traditional knowledge, learning uh, the, the IKS, the indigenous knowledge system. And we know right now, as we speak, that this provides a fantastic third way for adaptation to climate change. It is something that must be had, this conversation must be had. So to actually build the self-confidence of that woman, that child, we have to inculcate in her the notion that she has to drive quality in everything that she's doing. And that will automatically boost up her self-confidence. And of course, if you're a woman operating in this, in this sphere, one thing that you also have to do is develop a very thick, thick crocodile skin because you'll get hit above and below the belt. So just get ready for that and uh, just, just, just stay focused into what you want, into what you believe and into what you want to do and just stay focused on the course and that's it. <laughs> wow, um, great, great advice. Um, have an, an, another great question from our audience. Um, are there any programs uh, on the continent targeting educating boys and men about the benefits of empowerment of women? Well, it's a very good question. Um, you know, uh, Mike, is that we need to start having this. Uh, it is, uh, unfortunately, I, I, well, myself, I drive that in all my speeches, the advantage, in fact, I say now, it is uh, no longer ethical or moral uh, to educate a girl, but we have to drive in the economic perspective. And I think this is where, uh, you know, the leaders will listen. It's only when you start hitting their pockets that they will start listening. So definitely there, there is a space uh, for speaking to, to men, but speak it in a language 
that uh, they understand that makes economic sense to get these women out there. And it's just no longer just moral or ethical, but uh, it makes good economic sense, create jobs and uh, speak to the politicians and speak to the, to the policymakers. Because as I said earlier on, they are mostly men because women are not there at that table. In fact, what I have always said is, and I will say it again here, if the women don't see themselves at the table, bring your own chairs and make sure you have a space at that table so that you can shape the policy and uh, you know, make, change the narrative and make a difference. Well, thank you. I, I, unfortunately, I just have a couple minutes left. I feel like I could continue this conversation for hours uh, with you, but I guess my last question would just be around, you know, for, uh, for, the, for, for the audience, um, you know, what could we do really as individuals, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis in our own communities, in our own countries, with our families, what could we be just doing on a day-to-day -day basis to support gender equity and the issues that you've been talking about? We have to start mentoring women. And I, you know, Mike, there's one thing as well, we, I, I must confess, is that uh, men, when they mentor women, these women, they go very, very far. So there is a big role for, for men to take that figurative daughter, figurative sister, figurative girlfriend, and boost her self-confidence. And again, tell her that she can do anything, but it needs to be done one by one, one to one. And um, that's what we can do. This is how we're going to build it. But again, stay focused on the law because the law is the only kind of uh, environment in which we can um, look at the rights of women and of course, well, eventually the responsibility, but uh, especially the rights and shape that so that it works for, for the community and for the country. Well, Dr. Garif Hakim, thank you so much for, for those final comments. Um, I would just say, I, I think I could speak for the full audience in saying what uh, an inspiring uh, keynote, um, really appreciated your very thoughtful responses to the questions and the questions from our audience. Um, I know I've been taking kind of furiously taking notes as you've been talking about, uh, you know, talking about these issues. So thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate you being with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you to the entire Yale community for, for inviting me. It's, a, it's been a great honor and a great pleasure to share some thoughts with you. Have a great two days. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye.